presentation is going to be given uh, by Yambo Liu. Uh, and Yambo is an incredible thinker. Uh, she thinks a lot about uh, cities. She thinks a lot about uh, different regions around the world and how that is going to affect marketing and how it's just going to affect the world. Uh, she gave a presentation in February with our partners at Social Media Week, uh, and it was so good they actually asked her to come back uh, the, like the next day and give the presentation again. Um, so there's a lot to learn about Yambo. She's well read. Uh, she's an amazing speaker. She has amazing ideas, and she made a, a, a brand new presentation today all around sort of the, the idea of choice in China uh, that I think you guys are all going to really love. And so I don't want to keep her from the stage any longer. So please join me in welcoming Yambo Liu. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, James, for such a kind introduction. I am thrilled to be here today, and I'm very excited to talk about what I think is the most definitive transition in modern China. Um, this is a transition that has affected every single Chinese person who's alive today, myself included. I wouldn't be standing here in front of you had there not been this transition. And what I hope that you leave here with today is some answers, but I actually hope that you leave here with more questions than answers, because if you are at all interested in this market, this is a topic that deserves a lot of thought and consideration, and it really begs to be further explored. So uh, what you see on the screen right now is an aerial shot of the Shanghai skyline. And you have the Huangpujiang River flowing through the city. You have the iconic Oriental Pearl TV Tower. And this image to me represents a lot of the modern urbanization of China, right? The boom of its cities, which is happening not only in Shanghai, but across the country. And you think of the millions, of the hundreds of millions of new consumers that live in these cities and the demand that they generate. And all of this growth has been made possible by this transition, which is not one of technology, right? This is a transition that in and of itself is not technological. It is the emergence of choice. When you think about this emergence of choice, this is something that we almost take as second nature here in the States. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about what that actually means. What was China like before the emergence of choice and what it's like today afterwards? But most of all, we're also going to talk about what this means for the enterprise and what this means for brands. So just to begin, um, if you think about the enterprise as an economic unit or an economic organization, it's designed to respond to economic changes. But I think that China is often reduced to quantitative metrics, statistics, and in and of itself, those do very little to provide color into the nuances and complexities of the market. So if we think back to the late 70s in China, before it became open to the Western world, before the emergence of choice, um, at this time, China was a poor country, right? The average income was um, less than a third of sub-Saharan Africa's. Chinese people were on average poorer than North Koreans. And there was no choice, which uh, is difficult to comprehend because we really do think about the ability to choose as an individual as almost second nature, right? Think about your own lives. When you were children, maybe your parents made choices for you, but as you became a teenager, as you uh, passed through high school, you probably looked at some colleges that you were interested in going to, applied to them, decided to go to one of them, looked at jobs you were interested in, took a job you were interested in, and then chose an apartment to live in, went to the grocery store, bought what you wanted to eat, and none of that was possible in China, right? Um, from the time that you were a child passing through the education system, as soon as you exited that education system, the state decided what you would do. It was the system that governed your choices, so they would decide where you worked. And depending on where you worked, there was a system of organization that dictated what you ate, because you took most of your meals at work, where you lived, because your place of employment gave you a house to live in. Uh, it also dictated what you wore, where you bathed, because probably your house didn't have a bathroom with a shower. It also dictated uh, who you married and who you divorced even. So literally, this concept of choice is very, very new, and especially this concept of individual choice. 
this all began to change in the late 70s into the 80s and through to the early 90s as reform and opening opened the country to not only the West, but brought about these macroeconomic changes, right? The decollectivization of agriculture, privatization of industry. Uh, you also have um, investment, foreign investment specifically. And while these were largely macroeconomic policies, they also had a pretty dramatic trickle down effect to the individual, which you can see probably most prominently in the real estate market. Uh, up until 1998, you could not buy or sell your own house in China, and you could not choose where to live. So your place of employment, your work, would assign you a house. And this system was called the Dunway housing system. Dunway literally means uh, work. Um, so when this was abolished in 1998, for the first time ever, people could buy and sell their own homes, and they could choose where to live. And now, in less than 20 years, you have what is the world's largest real estate market. And what you see on the screen here is not the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. This is the Eiffel Tower outside of Hangzhou, a second tier city in China. This is where people are choosing to live, how they're choosing to develop their homes. Um, but that's just one example, right? And that's in China. Um, what I want to talk about now is how this actually affects us in the rest of the world. China is already an enormous market, and it is the largest market for beer, wine. China now consumes more wine, 1.86 billion bottles of red wine last year. It's also the largest market for luxury goods, for gold. It buys more gold now than India. It's the largest market for movies, for energy, and for cars. So that GM now sells more cars in China than it does in America. Brands are adapting for this market, right? You see brands like Haagen-Dazs innovating for the Chinese market, creating uh, faux moon cakes for the moon festival. Uh, these are, of course, imitation moon cakes made out of ice cream. Um, you have some brands which are iconic here in America, like Mattel's Barbie, uh, where in China they opened a six-store uh, sort of mega Barbie shop with a spa, a cocktail bar, and unfortunately it wasn't so successful because Chinese parents didn't like Barbie's study habits, so they didn't want to buy Barbies for their children. <laughs> You also have Home Depot, which um, had similar challenges in the market because the DIY mentality, unfortunately, wasn't very popular with the sons and daughters of migrant laborers and farm and farmers who were striving to aspire to the new middle class. But you also have puzzling things of perhaps brands that are successful in China that are difficult to understand, right? Helen Keller optical frames. Um, <laughs> This is a domestic brand that is actually quite successful in China. And when the brand was interviewed by foreign reporters asking, why did you choose to advertise your glasses with the world's most famous blind person, the response was that Helen Keller is a story that's taught in all Chinese schools, and she's an icon of fortitude. So this is actually a very popular brand in China. But what that just goes to show is that understanding the psyche of the underlying cultural context is important. But even more important than that is understanding that this ability to choose is incredibly new and it's novel. And when you think about what China looked like in 1978, which was essentially like this, and what it looks like today, China today looks like this, right? This is a dramatic shift. It's, it's incredible to think about. And you might think, well, is too much choice debilitating? Because now people have so many choices where they had none before. But I would argue that that is, in fact, not the case at all. Uh, the image that you see behind the screen on you today is just one example of uh, how people enjoy the, uh, the process of choosing. This is a TV show that's centered around choosing. Uh, we're going to talk about several examples here, but you see Chinese people embracing choice, right? They're sort of thrilled by the novelty of, of this idea, and it's really embraced with a relish, so that even when you look at shopping, uh, we think of the US as sort of the, the largest consumer market in the world. But in fact, the Chinese seem to love to shop even more than we do. They spend three times the amount of time shopping than we do on average, right? And if you look at the e-commerce market, that's as far as you have to look to look at the size of this market, right? The projected spend by 2015 is about 510 billion US dollars. And that's in China alone. So 
what you're beginning to see now is that technology is an integral part of this exercising of choice, right? It's the tool used to make these choices. And when you look at the platforms, the social media that have developed in China, they're centered around this ability to make choice, right? These are two websites in China, Itao and Meili Shuo, which are both centered around helping people choose. Itao is a price comparison site, a price comparison site, and Meilishua is a peer review site. And you see these popping up all over the place. Um, the vast majority of Chinese people use tools like these to shop, whether they're shopping online or offline. And it's largely driven by mobile, because that's what people depend on to access these technologies. This percentage is even higher if you are, uh, if you are of a higher income bracket. But what all of this technology made possible was what was impossible before, right? Uh, expressing your own opinions, looking at other people's opinions, being able to assess and evaluate your options. And this is a very new thing. This ability, this, this technology that allowed you to do this happened to coincide with the emergence of choice. And that's a really powerful thing. Um, the young man that you see on the screen here is perhaps the best representative of this. He might be uh, the most famous blogger that you don't know about. Um, his name is Han Han, and he has half a billion followers on his blog, writes exclusively in Chinese. His blog posts average about a million hits per post. And he is representative of the modern psyche in, in China today, right? He is rebellious. He is everything that a good young Chinese boy should not be. He is contrarian. He writes um, very controversial posts about government policies, about the state of society. But what he's able to do is, via technology, transmit these opinions to hundreds and millions of people, which could never be done before. And I use that example because I think about what this actually means for the enterprise, right? What you have today in China is a booming market where the future growth will be driven predominantly by the booming middle class. By 2030, Brookings estimates that 70% of China will be in the middle class. That means almost a billion people will be in the middle class, and they will consume nearly 10 trillion US dollars in goods and services. That's extraordinary. And if you look at the most important subsect of this growing middle class, uh, it really falls into the baling ho, which literally means after the 80s, the generation of Chinese born after 1980. Coincidentally, they were also born into the age of technology, right? And this generation, this, uh, this generation is about three times the size of the baby boomer population here that has shaped our consumer demand for the past 50 years or so. They today comprise about 15% of urban consumption, but McKinsey estimates that in 10 years that will more than double to about 35%. So incredibly important. Um, and if you think about the last time that the middle class grew like this, it was really during the first industrial revolution, right? But to give you an idea of the scale and the pace of what's happening in China today, what's happening today in China is about 100 times the scale of what happened during the first Industrial Revolution at about 10 times the pace. An average Chinese person in 1978 made $200, and today they make $6,000 a year, which is, that growth is just incredible to think about. This is an unprecedented type of scale, right? And when I think about what this means for brands and the enterprise, think about the Industrial Revolution and what triggered, right? It was technology that triggered the Industrial Revolution. And it was fueled by coal and steam and, and modern transport. But what's unique about what's happening in China today is this growth has been triggered not by technology, but by a social condition, the emergence of choice. And it's been fueled by technology, which has acted as both its conduit and as a catalyst for driving this stupefying growth. Right In this emergence of choice, you have the tech boom that has allowed people to make choices and exercise choice. And what that means is that as a marketer and as a brand, you have to not only understand that psyche behind this newfound ability to choose, but the methods that are used to exercise that choice, which are deeply rooted in technology. And in essence, as a brand, your only hope in order to seize the opportunity in this market is to build systems to respond to those. 
So I know we're not taking any questions, but I'll be hanging around for the rest of the day. And if you have any questions, um, please come and find me. I'd love to chat. Thank you. Thank you.